I'll just say welcome to the Whalen Library. <laughs> and we are excited to have Susan Perry here to talk about her latest book, Lost Souls of Leningrad. Oh, thank you very much, Courtney. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's nice to be here. And we're doing things a little differently tonight because Leon and I are going to have a discussion, <laughs> I think, rather than uh, just an entire presentation. But um, not to put you on the spot, but have you read the novel? No. Okay, great. Then I get to tell you about it. <laughs> if, you, if you've read Please. it, sometimes sometimes it isn't isn't uh, quite, isn't it isn't quite the same. Anyway, so um, uh, as you can tell from the title, right? It's it's about Leningrad. It's a World War II historical novel set um, in the Soviet Union, um, and it uh, focuses on uh, a, a I mean a little known and very little talked about in the West historical event, the siege of Leningrad, when uh, from September 8th, 1941, till January 27th, 1944, the Nazis blockaded the city, uh, launched a, a serious bombardment, and then of course attempted to starve the civilian population to death. Um, uh, I mean, it's not talked about for a, a lot of reasons, some of which have to do with U.S.-Soviet relations start after the war, which really fell apart, uh, and and other things. But um, I um, uh, like to describe this novel as equal parts war epic, family saga, and love story. It's every bit as much a story about love and hope and the resilience of the human spirit as it is a story about the horrors of war and the brutalities of dictatorships. Um, it's really an intimate family saga uh, um, focused on within within this huge historical event, right? The, the camera comes into a, an intimate family story. And at, at the heart of that story, is a widowed violinist named Sofia Karabayeva and her teenage daughter, Yelena, who are trapped in Leningrad when the Nazis pull the noose tight. Now, the men they love, um, uh, a naval admiral, Vasily Antonov, uh, and a young soldier, Pavel Chernov, are outside the city fighting for Leningrad from, from where they are while the two women are struggling for survival inside. So that's that's the basic setup of, of the novel. Um, but uh, I, I, uh, I, and I should have already, whoops, I have to move things forward <laughs> differently. Sorry about that. So there's the, 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 a little bit of the statistics, um, you know, they, they really don't know how many civilians were in the city at the time. Um, uh, estimates really are from about two and a half to three million. They, they evacuated several hundred thousand children and um, uh, some elderly and um, uh, um, some women uh, during the summer before, after, after the Nazis attacked in June, but before the, they, they got to Leningrad. But a lot of refugees uh, came into Leningrad who were fleeing ahead of the advancing Germans. So no one really knows, but Two and two and three quarter million is 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 a good guess, and of those, about one million um, died, wow. and the vast majority of those were by starvation um, in the very first year of the siege. So it's a it's a very grim event, and um, but um, I I think I've I've actually made it an uplifting story, <laughs> and um, that was really um, one um, well. Well, it was one of my big goals, but before I do it, talk about the goals in the book, I want to um, just, well, this is a little bit hard to see, but um, this is the basic setup pre-war and the, in on June 22nd, 1941, the, you know, Nazi Germany, the Axis powers launched three and a half million men across the Soviet frontier all the way from the Baltic in the north, all the way to the Black Sea in the south. And um, Leningrad, I, I am going to actually stand up yeah. and, and point with my finger, for lack of a better thing. Okay. There actually are um, the city cities labeled, but you can't really see it. So Leningrad is right here at the end of the Gulf of Finland, which goes out into the Baltic. And I just want you to note this body of water. This is uh, Lake Ladoga. It's the largest lake in Europe. And it, it was very important um, uh, to the Soviets during the siege. Um, the uh, Soviets held territory due east of the city straight to the shore of that lake, which they maintained. So they had access to that lake um, during the war. And um, that 
that became 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 definitely became important to them. So um, back to telling the story and what my goals were. I mean, of course, every writer wants to write a good story, right? We, you know, we want readers to read it. We want, you know, people to be excited about it. And um, I kind of have a little anecdote about that when I uh, first had finished the novel and was um, trying to figure out how to publish it and talking to agents and things. I, um, I pitched to an agent, uh, a very high powered agent, actually. And it, it was it was a really enlightening um, conversation because she said to me, hey, the, the plot's great. It, it sounds very exciting, but I know a thing or two about World War II. And I know that hundreds of thousands of people starve to death. And how are you going to make that something people want to read, right? Really good question. Really good question. And I explained to her that I have several love stories in the novel that are very important. You have the middle-aged couple. I mentioned Admiral Vasily Antonov and Sofia Karabayeva. They actually were um, uh, were lovers when they were very young. Um, and, and their affair occurred just after they had married other people. And they met and then they fell in love. Um, that relationship ended uh, because um, uh, because duty and, and honor meant um, he was going to stay married to his wife, who was now pregnant. And anyway, so um, but they didn't see each other for many, many decades. And then um, they both their spouses died and at, at different times and they their paths crossed and they fell in love again bef before the war starts so you have that love affair you have the young teenagers are not so young but you know teenagers and um who were schoolmates and knew each other in school and as the build-up to the war starts to happen they're just drawn closer together also he's a violin student so she sees him when he comes for lessons with her grandmother that kind of thing anyway so you have that couple but really at the heart of it is this um story about the grandmother and granddaughter because it really is their own love story a story of devotion and family because the two of them are trapped under these horrible circumstances and one of the ways they survive is by helping each other is by being the fact that they're together so um I, I told the agent this and she nodded and said, send me the manuscript. Mm -hmm. she, she did not um, make me an offer of representation <laughs> in the end, but she did want, want to read it. So, but you want to tell a good story. It has to be balanced. It can't be, you can't write, um, you know, fiction that's just dark. Well, you can, but you're, you're going to have a hard time finding an audience. So I wanted to write a story that was both dark and light as it were. Um, and then I also wanted to tell a very broad story. There's not a lot of fiction written about the siege, um, uh, not by American or European uh, writers. And um, I mean, it is because it was such a dark event. And most of what's been written is a very narrow in scope. Um, there's a, a super book uh, written about 15 years ago by a man named David Benoff, who is the right was the writer for Game of Thrones. <laughs> So, so um, everyone's heard of that, even if we haven't, well, I, I did watch a few seasons, but anyway, um, and it's, it's a, it's a small book. It's not a novella, but it's really, but it's really short. It focuses on one week in October of 1941 and it's brilliant. It's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, but I, I wanted to do something big. I, was from the beginning fascinated by all the things that were going on during the siege. It wasn't just about rationing and starvation. It wasn't just about cold and, and there being, you know, winter and there being no heat. It was also about music, um, how the citizens were always uplifted by performances and the Radio Leningrad played music out of the loudspeakers that, every, that mm. were on the street that everyone had in their homes. Um, so music was very important. And that's actually why Sophia, the main character, our, our protagonist is a, a violinist um, with, the, with, the, with the symphonic orchestra. And, you know, I wanted to include things like, well, let me, let me, I'm gonna move ahead a little bit here. So this is um, an, a very bad picture, but it's what I have. Uh, I took it when I was in St. Petersburg in, in the Siege Music Museum. And it's a, as it says right there, ration chart. It is a chart of bread ration, the bread ration only. Um, 
Um, and it, you can see the dates on the left. The first date is 16th of July. So three and a half weeks or so after the Nazis attacked. And then it ticks down September, September, October, November, November, and, and then continues on December, January, and then the last two in February. And you can see, so the first column is workers. Um, so workers got uh, enough of a ration to survive most, most of the time. That was the goal. But you can see how it, it drops all the way down. It starts at 800 grams, which is two pounds, essentially. Um, not actually not, you know, not a bad ration, right? Two pounds of bread. And at that time, uh, the siege hadn't begun yet. So there was other food in the stores as well. So, but then it goes down, it goes all the way down to 250 grams. And you can see that in the last column, children and um, uh, dependents are in that last category. And they were only receiving, you know, about half, as it goes through, about half the ration all the time of what the workers were receiving. And um, that's part of the reason, of course, so many, so many civilians um, died. But I wanted to include this, of course, I wanted to include the harsh winter and all that, but I wanted some of the, you know, really uplifting things. Here's one of them. This is just a chart from that same museum. And it lists, there, there are 39 numbers uh, listed there, and they are all the schools that remained open during the siege. And this was a huge thing for morale in the city that uh, at least some of the city's children had a place to go every day. Um, I mean, they they got a bowl of of a bowl of steam, essentially, as Dickens would say, but really a bowl of hot water. Maybe a, they called it broth, and maybe it had a little bit of yeast in it, or maybe it had a few potato peelings in it, you know. But it was more. It was more just having a place to go, having a routine, uh, because people were hunkering down in, in their apartments. Winter started very early in October. And so people, um, you know, it, it really didn't have any place. There was nothing to do, no place to go. So it was great for the kids to be able to go. And wonderful that actually, I, I, I think of the teachers who must have taught them and how amazing um, really, really that it, that is. So, um, yeah, the library, since we're at a library, the main library in central Saint, in central, like sometimes I say St. Petersburg because that's what it's called now. You'll have to excuse me, in central Leningrad remained open during the siege. Wow. And when it started, um, they, they had heat and they still had electricity, but they lost that fairly early by November. And they kept meeting, people kept coming and they used candles. And then it got so cold that they shut off, they sh they closed most of the library, all the whole, it was a big library, big reading rooms, you know, with tables. Um, and they just met eight or 10 of them in the li head librarian's office. Mm -hmm. She had a, a big conference table and they would still show up. And some were doing research, some were just reading, some just needed a drop of normalcy, you know? So, so there were a lot of, um, I think really, you know, heroic, things that uh, uh, that occurred. Um, and my favorite of them is what's called the ice road or the road of life. I apologize for this picture, even if it were really clear, because it's all these different colors and all these lines, and it's a little bit difficult to figure out what's what. But the black is Leningrad, and that so to the left is the Gulf of Finland. And by the way, that island there is called Kronstadt, and that's where the Soviet naval uh, fleet, the Soviet Baltic fleet was, was stationed during the war. Um, they, they had been at Tallinn, in Estonia, which was a Soviet Republic then, but um, they retreated to, um, uh, to, to Kronstadt, and they were there during most of the siege. And then it's about 25 miles across that orange, and then you're at the shore of this lake, Lake Ladoga. And this thumb of the lake was about 20 miles across, and the uh, both sides were Soviet-held territory. Now, the Germans were in the middle, where the hash lines are is the, lot, the, the front lines, right? So the Germans were down there, and they were there, and of course the Finns were above. But the uh, Soviet government decided that they would build a road across the lake, and it was, as I said, a very cold winter, a very early winter. The only good thing about it was that the lake froze very early. And they were uh, bringing, they were 
they were shuttling supplies across in December already. It froze in November. Um, and this is a huge, monstrous lake, so it's pretty amazing they could do that. And um, by January, they had 30,000 people working on this, on, wow. this, on this ice road. They had six lanes of traffic, truck traffic, oh going every day, steady, through the night. You know, three going across, three coming back. And then in, at the end of January, they decided they would start evacuating civilians. And they did that. They would, would uh, starving citizens would take, there was a train, would take the train to the lakeshore and they'd be loaded onto the open flatbed trucks and and um, taken across to safety. So, so it's really that, the ice road or the road of life as the Russians call it, it's a very heroic a part of the story although of course it was they, they couldn't save the people i mean they did save some certainly but also you know they brought all those supplies across and the first supplies go to the party officials and the mm -hmm. government officials and the next go to the military understandably so and the next go to the people who are handling the food <laughs> who put, take a little bit and put it in their bag and so a ton of graft and it took a long time for the food to show up in in stores in the city but Nevertheless, it's a it's a really a, a heroic uh, story, the the ice road. So I really wanted to include that. Well, in order to include all these kinds of different things, you know, the library and the schools and the ice road, I had to have a cast of characters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that the the type of story I wanted to write, a, kind of an epic story, um, uh, dictated my my choice of characters. Um, so I selected characters who um you know each experienced different parts of the siege and yet were linked together and so um uh, it allowed me to really cover um just about just about everything that that was going on everything from you know the rations and people putting wood burning stoves in their homes and cutting up their furniture to burn and all all kinds of things to you know to the ice road and 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 to what was going on with the military so um that's in essence why i have four point of view characters the 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 two couples the uh, the, the older couple, Sophia and Vasily, and the younger couple, Yelena and Pavel. And the story is told from each of their perspectives. Every chapter is a, a, kind of a different perspective. It doesn't alternate exactly or anything, but you know, they they each they each get their turn to tell what's going on or what they're what they're experiencing. So so that um that structure allowed me to um write a broad story um of the siege. And um and then to go back really quickly to that there we are to the goals i i really of course also want to increase the understanding of world war ii and the the soviet experience uh, and the relationship between world war ii and russia today mm -hmm. um i think you know we're all horrified and stunned i mean we're horrified and stunned again after hamas's attack we're all it's it's it seems like there's yeah it's constant but we're horrified about what's happened in ukraine and is still happening and um you know why would why would they do it and it's interesting you know world war ii is for a lot of us in the u.s especially i think it's very far away um i mean uh you know it's it's just not um yeah, it it was something happening over there. And yes, we lost, you know, a lot of soldiers and there was a lot of grief, but it was nobody on our land, you know. I, I can't completely explain it. I know when I was growing up, which was in the 60s and early 70s when I was in high school, and, uh, you know, almost nothing was said in my textbooks about the Eastern Front you know, about what was going on in the Soviet Union. And um, that's completely different in Russia. I mean, it is near history for them. They're, anyone my age in their mid sixties, they their parents fought or their grandparents did, or they died, or, you know, it's very close history. And Putin, of course, has used that tremendously to his advantage to um, create a whole nationalism, again, built again over World War II and, and uh, fascism, the, the West, um, you know, finding finding enemies um, wherever wherever he can, he can. It's an interesting thing about Vladimir Putin, just a little, another little anecdote. He was born in Leningrad in 1952, 
And his parents lived there during the war. His mm -hmm. dad was Red Army and survived, was injured, but survived. His mother lived in Leningrad and survived the siege. Now, they had, his parents had a child, um, an infant slash toddler son, who would have been Putin's older brother, but he died of starvation during the siege. And I think about that family history that Putin grew up with, and it is even more stunning that he could do what he's doing to Ukraine when he grew up in a place that was brutalized by a foreign power, right? It's, yeah, it's one of those things that's just hard to make sense of, you know, um, but, but anyway, so, so, so it is, unfortunately. Um, but it just, just the point that World War II is very important uh, to Russia today. And, and I really wanted to write a novel about, about World War II and about the Soviet experience because of that. Um, and of course, lastly, and maybe this goes without saying, but I wanted to convey to the reader what, um, uh, you know, dictatorship looks like mm -hmm. on a very personal level, you know, and the, the opening chapter in the book is, uh, was written the way it was precisely for that purpose, um, that everyone lived in fear, they could the KGB, the NKVD at the time, could knock on the door and take you away and put a bullet in your head or send you to a camp. There was no justice. There was no. There were no rights. And I think it, it's another thing about the U.S. I think part of it is our size. We're somewhat inured to what happens in other places. And I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people today who don't understand that, you know, democracy, sure, it's cumbersome. Sure, it's unwieldy and inefficient and a pain, downright pain much of the time. But it's a lot better than any alternative you can point to, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I wanted to write a book that really pointed at dictatorship. Um, so, of course, you've got the, the two big dictators of the century, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, Hitler and, and Stalin. But, but um, yeah, so let me move back to where I was here. Whoops. Sorry. So, and as far as World War II goes, I, I do like to, to point out a lot of people know a fair bit about World War II. This is just four, four nations and the casualties, right? Uh, the U.S. lost 420,000, the U.K. 450,000. Germany, um, that, again, this is a, a bit of a guess, about 8 million. The military figure is quite accurate. It's, it's probably between 5.2. Two five and five point five, uh, the number of military. The civilian um, casualty figures are very inaccurate. Uh, th those a lot of those happened when the Soviets came through and slaughtered people mm -hmm. um, at, in, as they were going to Berlin. And so a lot of that is not documented anywhere. Um, and then the USSR. Try to imagine twenty eight million people. I mean, it's you know, and yes, that's not 100% accurate either. It's probably somewhere between 23 and 29. I've seen figures as high as low 30s, but anyway, 9 million military, 19 million civilians, you know. So um, anyway, uh, I, it's funny. I, I really want the Soviet experience to be conveyed, but I don't want a lot of sympathy um, in a way, right? Because I want us to understand you know, what's evolved since then. I mean, I want sympathy for that era and for the people who, you know, were starving to death during the siege. How can you not feel sympathy, right? But um, I also want people to realize that they had leaders then and they have leaders now who are bent on doing really, really horrible things. So, so, um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about, and uh, is um, first just the story behind the story. I think most most writers have a reason, right, that they write a novel. I mean, sometimes a lot of, I mean, a lot of nonfiction, a lot of memoir is written from, of course, personal experience. And um, but um, I I do have a, a story, and it, it goes back about four and a half decades. I was a college student at Purdue University, majoring in in uh, in political science and Russian language, and uh, my last semester there, I was able to go study in Moscow. This was 1978-79. And um, I went with a small group of North Americans, um, Canadians and, uh, and Americans. And it, it, there were only two 
two avenues to go study in the USSR at that time. And one was a summer program and one was this one semester uh, program. It was very limited. Um, I, I really feel to this day very lucky that I had that experience. And so, I mean, it, it was uh, amazing. We, we went to a language institute every day, a small institute in the center of Moscow. And we, we lived in a big hotel for foreign students that sat just at the edge of the of Moscow State University, which is a really big, a big campus. And um, it, it was it was amazing. But I just want to talk about one thing really that happened during that time. And that is we went to Leningrad for a few days and um, it was very gray. It was March and a lot of the city hadn't been hadn't recovered yet from the war. Um, uh, things just hadn't really been spruced up as, as I don't know. Have you been to St. Petersburg? By any chance no 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 yeah yeah Almost yeah yeah now probably oh you were yeah, so close it was, well it was december oh oh ouch so there, were, there were no english language tours oh my gosh yeah yeah well and it is um, harsh in the winter for sure but um it's it's actually a beautiful city today a gorgeous city. It's a city of the water. You know, Peter the Great built it in the early 1700s on, on marshland. And a big river, the Neva River, flows from Lake Ladoga out to the Gulf uh, of Finland. And the city sits on either side of it. And there's all kinds of canals and small rivers that branch off. So there's a lot of bridges. Um, but it's very flat and very low lying. And it has gorgeous architecture. I mean, everyone knows the Hermitage, the former winter palace of the Tsars. But um, you know, and the collection inside, oh my gosh, but there's a lot of beautiful uh, architecture around the city. Um, but for me, the the most important day was the day we went to um, uh, Piskorevskaya Memorial Cemetery, which um, which is the largest memorial cemetery in the in the Soviet Union. Um, it, whoops, sorry. Um, you can see at the top, this is the view you get when you walk you're walking down big granite steps and there's this long alleyway, maybe five or 600 meters long. And on either side, there are mass graves. And um, at the end of the alleyway, there's a big bronze statue. It's down at the bottom in the bottom photograph there of Mother Russia. And behind that are inscriptions honoring the those who lost their lives during the siege. Um, and yeah, each, each grave has a simple granite marker, like, like the one at the top there, that um, has the year and the symbol at the top, the hammer and sickle denotes civilians, uh, civilian remains are there, and a red star, not a red star, sorry, just a star <laughs> denotes uh, um, soldiers. Although, it's very interesting, the, the other, um, in the other photograph you'll see from 1942 with the wreath on it, you can't really make it make it out, and it's in Russian anyway. But it is the cruiser Kirov. It's dedicated to the seamen who died. And in in April of forty two, there was a huge attack, um, and the Kirov lost a couple several hundred mm -hmm. uh, seamen at, at, in that attack. And actually, uh, Admiral Antonov is injured in that attack. And that's that's um, so. Um, uh, but you you have these. Um, you know, these raised beds on either side, there are about 200 of them. In the oh my gosh. And each one has thousands of remains. Yeah. Were those remains <clears throat> relocated from somewhere else or during the war, during the siege were they planted there? They actually started during the siege and they finished after, but they began digging in um, 1942. Oh. Um, they they began it uh, in the, actually not maybe even like March April. I mean they brought in explosives. They brought the military in with equipment to dig huge wow. uh, these huge trenches essentially to um, bury people. But I was 21 years old, and <laughs> you know now I'd been to Arlington National Cemetery. It's gorgeous, right? It's very moving. And since then I've been to you know um, the American Cemetery at Normandy, which it will make anyone cry all those you know crosses and stars of david that just go off into the distance it's just anyway um but this was something else this was so stark and it just it really hit me like a ton of bricks i was like i mean there are thousands of remains in each grave almost 500,000 
victims, all unknown, all unknown. And to me at 21, it was just like, what? Whole families just got wiped from the face of the earth, you know? Now, I, I mean, <laughs> I'd like to say um, I, I decided uh, to, uh, uh, in that moment, to write a book about it, but I did not. And before I tell you what I did, I do want to point out this last picture of the young girl there who um, was a young teen during the siege and she kept a diary and these diary pages document the death the deaths of her entire family mm -hmm. each page has um, another member and the the month or the year or both on it and the last two pages uh, say um, everyone's dead I am alone mm -hmm. and she she survived but she survived the siege and was evacuated, but she then contracted, um, I forget, a serious illness, and she did die during the war. But um, anyway, it's just very, I sobbed when I was 21 mm -hmm. when I read that, those pages, you know, yeah. So, um, you know, it was, yeah, it was just so moving, but I w did not, at the time, I had an idea, maybe someday I might want to write a book, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, want to be a writer. I had other plans. I went back to the U.S. I went to graduate school. I got a great job at the Pentagon. I became an arms control negotiator for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, okay. and I helped negotiate the first agreement after Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the last leader of the Soviet Union, came into power in the 1980s. And then I spent a lot of time raising my family, uh, moved overseas a couple of times, um, and taught university while we were overseas. And uh, became a serious runner. And then finally in 2001, I came back with my, with my four teenagers and, uh, and uh, um, became a cross high school cross country coach, which I did for 15 years until, I don't know, all my kids left. Yeah. And I was like, I was, in, you know, like 57, 58. And I thought, okay, I have time for one last act. What am I going to do? <laughs> and I, in that moment, the writing a book came back to me and instantly the siege came to me. And I, I, I just knew then that, that that's what I would write about. Or, so, yeah. Are you fluent? <laughs> no, I'm not, not, not at all. I, I mean, I still speak a but, little bit. But how did you do your research? Oh, my research is all, almost all English language. And I, I went there in 2017 and I found just, I mean, this is one of the good things about the internet, right? I found a, a guide, uh, a, a relatively young man, I would say, maybe 30-ish, whose grandmother was a siege survivor. Mm. And the result, I actually, he wouldn't let me, he, she won't meet anyone. She wouldn't meet me, but he knew everything and took me places throughout the city wow. that I never could have, could have gotten to. Otherwise I never would have known about. Um, yeah. To do, to, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Some of the Russian books, some of the books in Russian about the siege. That is the technical books, the military books. Some of them have been translated now. Um, I actually have um, a, a small book that was written fairly soon after the war by a man named Dmitry Pavlov, who was the head of the food supplies in Leningrad. And he wrote a book about it. Wow. And it's a very, it's a technical book, right? It's a nonfiction and there's no emotion in it, but it's a fascinating book and really documents, you know, who got what, when, and all that. So there have been some that have been translated to English. And frankly, I relied on um, uh, a couple of really good um, uh, American and English historians. There's a great the best history ever written, actually, still even now, is um, written by uh, an American named Harrison Salisbury, who in 1960, and who wrote a lot about, you know, international issues and the, the Washington and the government mm -hmm. and other things. But he wrote a fantastic, um, uh, you know, uh, book about um, a, very detailed about about the siege. And so I got a lot of my information from English <clears throat> English sources and some really interesting side information from this guide I, I had who who like um you know talked about even though I had I had seen pictures in books but talked about how um his grandmother talked about the sleds so they, they had it's a northern city everyone has a sled right uh, you know wooden slats on runners well during the siege they were used to 
uh, hall bodies, the cadavers after people died, um, you know, and, and his grandmother had told him stories about that, you know, so, so I, you know, I didn't get exactly firsthand. <laughs> um, I was really hoping I might, but you know, you, you yeah. <laughs> tiny bit. That's pretty close. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty close. close. It was, was pretty, close. it was pretty close. And it's funny now, actually, uh, there are a lot more diaries that have been translated huh. into English. It's very interesting. Um, you know, for a long time, they said, oh, nobody kept a diary during the siege because it was so grim. But it turns out there were quite a few. And um, yeah, I, I read a number of them. And that was also a very enlightening, you know, source um, of information. So, um, no, my Russian's not. I mean, I can manage when I'm there, you know, to order dinner and <laughs> get a ride and, you know, but, you know, after so many years, you know, you, you don't use it, you lose it. So. Yeah. Were there any archives or anything like that? Like you visit the museum? They, they do have archives. You need, you have to live there probably for about at least four, three or four months to be able to have access. Um, they do have archives and, and um, you know, military archives. A lot of those are in Moscow, but those used to be accessible for, um, you know, whether they would have allowed an average citizen you know, access to them is a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. If I was a PhD student doing research from Harvard, I would have, I would probably be able to get huh. access kind of thing. Um, you know, but then I would actually need a translator because my Russian, like I can, I can read and I can, when people talk, I can understand, you know, two thirds of what they say. But when you're doing research, you have to understand a hundred percent. So I would have spent all my time, like, you know, looking up words in, in the dictionary. So yeah anyway but so so that's that's kind of the that's kind of the story other other thoughts or anything you'd like to know or so i think every i'm a non-writer <laughs> when did you first start thinking about it I mean, as far as not, I want to write a book about the siege, but here's what, when did you start an outline? Right, out, an outline. I did, I when, did. It, when did you start it, an outline? It, it was 2015, um, late 2015. And, and so 20, I really kind of say 2016 was the year I really, I really dove in. Um, and did that, was that when you, did you go to did you go to Russia more than once? Not since then. I went in 2017. I was there for um I went for two weeks, which is the entire time I was in St. Petersburg. I didn't go anywhere else. I, I mean I've I have traveled there previously in, in in Russia and I really wanted to there was a lot to see. And I it turned out I wish I'd actually been there even a little longer, but this guy really like he knew <clears throat> we went to the edge of Lake Ladoga, the towns where, and they had just literally in January of that year. So this was in May, they had opened a brand new museum to the road of life. And it was amazing. I mean, just the documents and, and everything that they have there. So were you able to, so you were there for research purpose i was but i was there as a tourist i mean but had you had you already started how far along were you i oh I, I yeah when i went in 2017 i was already probably on my fourth or fifth draft really? yeah i was pretty far it, i i i started um I wrote my first draft in, in about eight months and um longhand 400 pages oh on gosh. yellow legal pads when i did it my my stepdad's a writer and an English professor was, and he, he said to me, I asked him for advice. And the first thing he said was, you could have picked an easier topic for your first <laughs> book. And I laughed. And then he said, he, he meant also structurally, because I have four characters. I'm writing from four perspectives, which is um, not not that easy for someone who doesn't know anything about writing. <laughs> you know, which, uh, and did you, did yeah. you, did you add things to the novel as a result of your two weeks in St. Oh, Petersburg in oh, 2017. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes, yeah. And well, did you regret not going earlier? Um, you know, it. I don't remember the reason. 2016. I had only. I so I had started writing. So I finished the first draft, and I think it was like late spring of 2016, maybe when I maybe summer, um, and. 
I was like the whole time I was writing and I was like, I have to, I have to get over there. When am I going to get there? And part of it was juggling it. I have a large family. Part of it was juggling. When could we do this? And I actually wanted my children. I have four adult children. I wanted them to come. Well, lucky. And yeah, I, I, I mean, me and them. Yeah, they, that's <laughs> for all of you. yeah. And so I was turning 60. I turned 60 actually when I was on the plane flying over there <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, it birthday. was, it was a great, it was a, it was a great birthday. So um, I had, my youngest daughter was in Europe uh, going to school. And so her schedule was such that she wasn't done until a certain date. So that's why I went ahead and spent the first 10 days by myself. And then she came and she did a little bit of the research with me for a few days. And then everyone else came. And then it was a tourist, yeah. mostly a tourist event. Did, did you have um did you have things lined up before you went? Did you have a uh, this guy? Yes. This young man. Did you, you had him lined up? Did you have, did you know where you wanted to go? I did, but I also knew that he would have some other ideas. And so like I had, I want to say the first like five days I was with him every day. And how much, and, you know, how much correspondence had you done with him before? The, it was before really, the it was really interesting um, I, because I just found him online. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want a traditional guide. I, I mean, I knew, I mean, they're great and, but they're focused on, you know, the big events, the big, uh, you know, the museums and the, you know, fabulous uh, architecture and stuff. And I wanted someone who knew something about the siege. And I, I emailed a bunch of people. That's what I did. And this guy came up and he worked for a reputable tourist agency. That was important because you never know what you, in another country, I mean, lots of countries, you never know what you're getting into. And um, Russia is kind of notorious for you know graft and doing things yeah in different ways you know you know if you want to get a taxi in the i have funny taxi stories there's no <laughs> such thing as a taxi cab in russia really you just put your hand out mm -hmm. and, and a private vehicle will come it's and pull up money. and you have to you have to haggle with them right. about how much they're going to charge you did, did you know that the that your your guide before you went i assume you knew your guide mm -hmm. had a grandmother who survived the sea yes he had told me that and do you have any idea how much agony is not the word but <laughs> did he try hard to get her to that, meet you or do you think it was just no that i don't know but i think um i mean he he told me a lot of the stories she had told him, but he said you know, she was, of course, getting very old mm -hmm. at that point. And he said, she won't talk about it at all. She won't tell me anything else about mm -hmm. it. She will not talk to a stranger about it. So I don't think he tried really. I think he knew his grandmother was not going to do it. I did not in the emails ever say, I'd really like to meet your mm -hmm. grandmother. Yeah. You know, I mean, to me, that would have just been a huge, a huge bonus, yeah. right? And so, um, do you know how old she was during the siege? She was. She was nine, nine, eight or nine when it started. So then like 12 or 13. Do you have any idea of what her, did she lose immediate family yes, members? Yes, they lost family members. I don't know which family mm -hmm. members. Has he read the book? <laughs> so it's interesting. He's he's in the dedication. Oh, okay. And um, just his first name though, because of course now now I'm, I'm like, I, I, I could never go to Russia, even if you could go to Russia, because I, I support um, anti-Russian causes. Like I support Alexei Navalny, who is the opposition mm -hmm. leaders in prison. And I, so I, I blog about that sometimes and I put posts on Instagram and actually the Russians are trying to hack my computer all the time. Wow. Yeah, I know. I say, my, so you're, you're, I mean, just at a higher level, you're on a list. I, yeah. You're not going to get, you're not going to get a visa. And, no, I would never get a visa now. And so, wow. but even beyond and, that, I, even if they gave me a visa, I would not go. I'd be petrified now. Yeah. Because I, you know, you, you, even if you're a foreigner, you don't have any rights. Look at, you know, Evan Gershkovitz, just mm -hmm. he's a legitimate journalist with the Wall Street Journal right. one day, and then he's in prison for who knows how many years he'll be in prison. It's, you know, so I, but, um, so, 
yeah, so I uh, have not tried to get in touch with him also because it would not be good for him. Yeah. I kept hoping maybe he had my address, my physical address. I kept, I did not have his. I kept hoping maybe he would send me a letter or something, but you know. Anyway. You never know. Yeah, you never know. Who knows? That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. yeah, that's right. Wow. Well, your villas. <laughs> that would be, no, really. um, that would be amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, but, how much? Yeah. How, how much research or what sort of how many books did you read before you wrote it oh well i read i read all the fiction except one <laughs> um and there there are only about 10 or 12 and the one i didn't read is because it's very highly thought of and, and so david benhoff's book i did read but it's a very different novel so it was but her book i was afraid I just didn't want to read it before. So I waited until my book was headed to publication. Either. And then I, and then I read it and then I thought I should have read this before, <laughs> but I, I did read, I have a whole library now uh, about probably about more than one of those shelves. I would say one and a half, maybe <laughs> of nonfiction about the siege. And, and did you read all of, did, is that, did you read that much? historical source material yes before or no during i i only I, right i only read before i started writing i had only read a couple of the novels and a salisbury's mm -hmm. poem and i read also a couple of general histories on world war ii just i wanted that, pers that perspective uh, an outside kind of perspective um just so i could have you know, the whole history in my mind as I was, you know, uh, approaching it. And then I start, then I started writing and I was, or plotting. I, at first I plotted it out. Um, you know, I knew all the events. I mean, I'm, it's kind of unusual when you're a writer, when you get the plot handed to you, which is kind of what happened to me. I mean, I knew, you know, I wanted to include all these, all these events. I just lined them up. Right. And then I had to figure out, okay. And the characters came very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Sophia came first because I want music was really important. Dmitry Shostakovich, one of the most famous Soviet composers, right. Was, was evacuated in October of 41. He didn't want to leave the city, but they insisted mm -hmm. he was writing, he was writing a composition. He was writing a symphony, mm -hmm. um, his seventh symphony, which became the Leningrad Symphony. And he was he was evacuated to a city on the Volga where six months later it premiered and then it caught fire. And the entire world, you can find, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. I mean, it, it premiered in London and Carnegie Hall. He was the toast of the world for this piece of music. And then finally it came back and this little ragtag orchestra that was left in the siege in Leningrad performed it in yeah. August of 42. And it, it was a, a huge event and it was something I had to have in my book. I just had to have that event, mm -hmm. right? So Sophie is a violinist and she's in that, she performs. So, you know, I, I, the characters kind of came at the same time as I was laying out the, the events. Did, did you need the Admiral as a character to present historical someone who would who was kind of up there looking at kind of a little bit more of a big picture yeah. as opposed to having a middle or whatever middle class is but not yeah a citizen right right a citizen who didn't have a lot of exposure to a yes. lot of things that's right i i did and also there there is a very famous uh, military event that happened that i desperately wanted to include in the novel at the end of august uh, so the war begins in June, right? And when the war begins, the the Soviet naval fleet, the Baltic fleet, is is at uh, Tallinn in Estonia, right? Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have been, become Soviet republics thanks to the uh, non-aggression treaty that Hitler and and Stalin signed in 1939, and so. They're all there. Everyone gathers there. Once war begins, every, I mean, vessels were all over the Baltic, right? They all come to Tallinn. And before you know it, Tallinn Harbor has 200 some vessels in it. Some of them are merchant ships. Some are even fishing vessels, but most of them are military, the Soviet military. And they're sitting there in this huge harbor waiting for the borders to retreat to Kronstadt. 
which it was the main base. Um, and of course, to help protect the city. So they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And finally, at the end of August, Moscow got its act together and gave them the order. But by that time, the Germans and the Finns had mined the entire Gulf. Oh and they lost, for example, 20, 25 of 27 troop transports, thousands, about 13,000 died in in that retreat um they lost more than half of the naval vessels uh went down and i you know no one knows about that even i didn't i you know i i worked at the pentagon and that that was a little part of history that it had escaped me i i did not know that that retreat had happened i mean we all read about dunkirk and dunkirk is you know, I mean, it is a, 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 an amazing story, right? You have all these fishing vessels coming to save save the soldiers. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But um, about 3,000 Brits died in Dunkirk versus 13,000 in the Tallinn retreat. Western, of course, many- Western history. Yeah, Western history. And many thousands were captured by the Germans. I mean, Dunkirk was was terrible, but, but no one knows that this horrific naval event occurred at early in the war right and so i i wanted i wanted a naval officer it was, so what was that character at all based on any historical character or, or was it just what you had read about what it was like being mm -hmm. you know, an admiral in the so in the soviet navy yeah in the baltic i think it was so one of the one of the one of the reasons i was an am in an unusual position to write about the Soviet Union in World War II is because I I also worked with the Soviets so I I worked with military officers and diplomats and KGB officers in the 1980s um, at, when we negotiated we were at an international conference in Sweden mm -hmm. for over two years and um, he is based on someone I worked with <laughs> but not not a soviet officer he's based on a swiss army general that mm. i knew very well and so yeah he's actually well, the so only what did you what did you draw from a swiss army general that <laughs> enabled you to it write was a... personality only yeah it was personality okay. mm -hmm. it was just personality there was no no the other stuff of course um you know but i i i know i i really did absorb how uh russians speak to one another how they interact and um, the time when I was a student and met many Russians and went to their homes, you know, um, then that was in the late seventies and then again, working with them. And I can say the thing I feared the most in writing this was that it wouldn't be accurate about, about, about how, how Russians speak and, you know, how they deal with each other and how they, you know, but um, I had two, Two people who are, are now they're acquaintances of mine, but I didn't know them until um, after the book came out. And they're both one, they're both uh, of Russian extraction. One has lived in the U.S. only three years and one 15 wow. years. And they both read the book and I was petrified, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely petrified. And they right. both loved the book and said, right. there's almost nothing in it that is not absolutely spot on wow. about how people talk to each other how they where they clip their sentences whatever you know and that's just something i absorbed while i lived there and then worked with, with them so were you yeah when you were writing did you did you conscious were you conscious of having spoken with these people from the soviet union and say, okay, this is how someone, this Russian would say something to this Russian. Exactly. So you were conscious of that. Absolutely. It didn't just flow. You I was you pulling, thought what, what would happen is I would be writing a scene and then the phrase would just pop, the Russian phrase phrase would just pop into my head. Boom. You know, um, because that's what that character would say in that moment, right? And sometimes I left it in Russian and sometimes I put them into English. I, I, there's, there is quite a bit of, not quite a bit, but there's some Russian in, in the book. And I didn't want to overwhelm the reader with that. Um, so sometimes I, even though the Russian came to me, I would say, no, I should just keep this in English. 